Hey, 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 you're watching this video because you love clowns. You want to hear about how great they are. Well, prepare to be disappointed. Today in Nerd History. Whether it's Pennywise the Clown from the new It movie, or Pennywise the Clown from the old It miniseries, or the Joker from Batman, or Doink the Clown from the WWF and WWE, clowns have indisputably become an icon of fear in modern pop culture. We've become so inundated with killer clowns from outer space, Sweet Tooth the Clowns from Twisted Metal, and Shaggy Two Dope Clowns from Michigan, that the image of a violent evil clown has become a tired cliché. In fact, fear of clowns is so pervasive that there is even a name for it. Cholrophobia. A term that's recognized by the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which is about as official as you can get as far as recognition by the mental health community. So what is it about clowns that makes them so scary? Well, there's no simple answer. Now pretend that I'm wearing like a lab coat and a professor hat and that I'm like a cool professor that you want to hang out with and talk about clowns with for a while, because today we're going to get into not only the psychology of clowns, but the history of clowns. So we're going to figure out what is it that makes clowns a symbol of terror? <laughs> there are two sides to discuss when it comes to the fear of clowns. What's going on in the mind of the person observing the clown, and then what's going on in the mind of the clown. Let's start with the familiar side of things. Your reaction to seeing a clown. Assuming that my audience is not 2.5 million people dressed as clowns, in which case I should probably be drinking way more Faygo. Let's leapfrog Freud and his definition of the uncanny and jump straight to something that's been getting a lot of play lately, the uncanny valley. Coined by robotics professor Masahiro Mori in 1970, the term refers to the response of revulsion towards something that approaches familiarity but falls just short, which inspires a feeling of unease and displeasure. You most likely associate this with robots or bad CG or Nicolas Cage's acting, but it certainly applies to clowns, whose makeup pushes them outside the bounds of familiar human identity. Well, some of this has to do with the hair, the noses, the big shoes, the biggest effect comes from the frozen, painted on expression. Similar to observing a wax figure or one of those mind-bogglingly expensive realistic sex dolls, the human mind processes the smile of the clown as a broken mechanism of emotion something that's unwell or incorrect for its inability to change. And much like expensive realistic sex dolls, they seem like they're probably very sticky. Have you ever found yourself reflexively smiling back at a stranger without realizing it? It's your human instinct to automatically respond to emotions, and makeup that dictates or suggests your automatic response, particularly in situations where you may not want to smile back, can leave you feeling uneasy, fearful, or frustrated. Our brains are nothing but a complex network of neurons firing randomly in a vast, lonely galaxy. The last thing that we need is some creepy fucker wearing some face paint that dictates how we're supposed to feel. Capping it off is the fundamental disconnect in presented tones. Jerry Robinson, the creator of The Joker, despite what Bob Kane might tell you, studied up on villains at Columbia University. He became convinced that the best villains were those who had inherent contradictions. For instance, a maniacal ne'er-do-well behind a guise of perverted bombastic joy. But your automatic responses are not all that's to blame. Clowns are fundamentally emboldened by the same thing that gives us pause. Their disguise. Basic psychological principles suggest that anonymity is disinhibiting, evidenced in mask-wearing criminals, or comment sections on videos about clowns. Just as an example, not like I'm bitter about it and lose sleep over it. This has been proven time and time again like a 1978 study from Purdue University that showed that kids in Halloween masks were more likely to steal extra candy. Or the infamous Stanford Prison Experiment, which revealed how quickly normal people, given the power of prison wardens, are corrupted by that power, in no small part due to the mirrored sunglasses they wore. The costume inherently creates a power dynamic, leaving the poor sucker who's left alone in a room with the clown feeling exposed and upset, probably because the clown has a knife and is going to stab them in the face and the body until they're dead but also the costume. Okay, 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 so all this information is neat and all, but I still don't get it. When did clowns turn bad? Wasn't there a time when grandmas roamed the earth as children where clowns were beloved by all? Not exactly. <laughs> clowns were always bad. Oh, okay, maybe not bad, but from their first exposure to the world, clowns were typically presented as buffoonish and mischievous, and not necessarily as somebody that you'd want to leave alone with your children. Not even you, Ronald. You've got a higher body count than any of the other guys. 
While clowns are typically attributed to have risen out of the medieval court gesture, their roots are actually more accurately pinned to the theater of Greek and Roman antiquity. This character archetype was kind of a rustic fool, later elevated by Shakespeare in the plays Othello in A Winter's Tale. But it wasn't until the 1800s that the clown that we all know got its horrible, horrible face. A performer, Joseph Grimaldi, not only invented the so-called white face clown that we all still know today, he even set the long-lasting precedent of clowns harboring sadness and secret darkness. Although he was estimated to have entertained one-eighth of London's population, he died as an alcoholic and total squalor in 1837. Yet, the image persisted and eventually transformed into the now all-too-familiar American circus clown. For a while, this clown did have some years of youthful, fun, naive innocence. Or maybe kids in Dust Bowl America were just eating too much lead to realize how terrifying clowns actually are. Because after the Great Depression, booming post-war America began to associate the image of the clown with sorrow and desolation. This image wasn't exactly helped by a string of 33 child murders in the 1970s by one John Wayne Gacy, who had performed at children's parties as Pogo the Clown. Though his murders weren't necessarily committed in costume or character, he came to be known as the Killer Clown and injected a line of fear straight into the public consciousness. In the following decade, the stage was perfectly set for the clown to become an icon of pop culture terror. The 1980s were a time of heightened awareness of child abductions. The pictures of missing kids on milk cartons started in 1984. And clowns fit the very definition of strangers who hide behind masks of deceitful anonymity and deal primarily with children. And so we began to see characters like the killer clown doll in Toby Hooper's 1982 film Poltergeist, or Pennywise the Clown in Stephen King's 86 horror novel It, and the following miniseries. And over the next couple decades, the image of the evil clown calcified in the public consciousness until the 2010s, when it actually kind of started spilling over into reality. In 2013 in Northampton, England, a man dressed as a creepy clown hung around in public spaces, creating a buzz of horror and mystery. And evidently, this resulted in the man receiving thousands of death threats when his identity was finally revealed, because, of course, duh, what were you expecting? But this event also escalated to the 2016 worldwide epidemic of creepy clowns popping up just about everywhere. It was a lot of people's idea of a fun goof, because people like making other people miserable. This also is not a surprise. We now live in a post-clown world. I mean, you're welcome, by all means, to still be afraid of clowns, but it's about time that we stop pretending that we were ever supposed to like them. Multiple recent studies show the majority of children have negative responses to clowns. On top of that, evil clowns in the year 2017 are no longer a subversion of a joyful archetype, but rather as a tiresome retread of an archetype that has been recontextualized as evil and scary decades ago. So why are clowns scary? Well, the answer might be disappointingly simple. Clowns are scary because they're supposed to be.